canal-based surgeries. Overview. AP Baldur versus canal-based surgeries. Uh, second, I want to talk about the technology and the techniques using examples, show you some results and compare those of different um, canal-based surgeries, talk about the challenges, and finally provide an outlook. Epibulbar versus canal-based surgeries. Here you can see um, on the left side various epibulbar drainage options, a tube shunt out of, made out of silicone, this is the armored implant, a new pressure flow micro shunt, a gel shunt, the Zen, that can um, restrict flow. Uh, this is an internal diameter of 45 microns, this of 70 microns. Um, and although they drain the fluid into the subconjunctival space or subtenon space as a tr uh, typical uh, traditional trabeculectomy, the flow is guarded through the restrictor elements here. Uh, with a tube shunt, there is a true valve uh, that's also meant to um, guard flow, but in this case, it is a pressure sensitive um, mechanism meaning that it should only open uh, above 10 millimeter mercury. On the right you see uh, the gold shunt, the Cypass, both of which are super choroidal drainage devices. There was great hope um, in putting these devices. They're inserted into the super choroidal space, a, a potential space. Uh, they can potentially achieve very low eye pressures. Um, but um, since this is sclera, um, only on the inside, uh, this is the same fibrosis that you would find on the outside uh, that affects these devices as well. The Cypass, um, unfortunately, was taken from the market not because of issues with the pressure, but because it tended to migrate anterior and through the scleral spur and finally ended up damaging the endothelium. The Cycladaza spatula is a uh, rather old device, uh, probably at least 80 years old, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and you inserted this uh, approximately five millimeters posterior to the sclera and then disinsert the ciliary body, um, thereby creating a large cycloanalysis for flow. Uh, problem with this is that you can get very low eye pressures, um, such low pressures that uh, there are choroidal folds uh, and macula, chronic macular edema from that. And then they would suddenly close because there's no space holder like the Cypass, for instance, um, and pressure would shoot to very high levels. Uh, that was painful and dangerous. Complications of these traditional epibulbar surgeries, trabeculectomy and tube shunts can be overfiltration with a flat chamber, leaking blap, uh, hypotony with uh, so-called kissing choroidus that you see here where the retina touches. Uh, fluid is under the choroid, but that pushes the retina towards each other. Eroding hardware, this is a tube shunt here. There too, uh, this tube has aspirated some vitreous somehow. Uh, and this here, uh, blebitis, an infection of the bleb and endophthalmitis, which occurs in up to 7% in some studies. This is not a, a study from nowhere. This is actually a study conducted very well at the Mayo Clinic. And of course, we live in uh, blissful uh, ignorance as glaucoma surgeons, or we try to ignore this. Um, who likes to face the fact that up to 7% of our patients can eventually face such a devastating infection? Um, but that's simply the truth. Uh, and here, a case of too much mitomycin, where you can see the uh, uvea through the melted sclera. This is quite different with um, conventional flow-enhancing Schlem's canal implants or trabecular disruption, because the pressure can only ever reach that of um, episclerar veins. Here is the hydrus, a, a the leaf, eight millimeter long scaffold device, um, the eye stands inject, second generation and first generation. Uh, and on this side, you see um, gonioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy where you thread a suture 360 degrees around. It doesn't always work because Schlumps canal is not continuous oftentimes. 
Um, there can be septations, there can be duplication, as we know from canaloplasty also. Uh, there's the TRAP360, which um, allows, to, in a controlled fashion, to extend a proline wire halfway around 180 degrees and then turn it the other way and do the same thing here. Um, elegant but expensive. The oldest uh, mix, perhaps, minima minimally invasive glaucoma surgery or microincisional glaucoma surgery, um, the trabectome introduced uh, in 2003. Here's the trabex, which is actually the predecessor of the trabectome. It has two blades, but the inventor, George Barvold, thought it would create too much drag and um, was not as uh, elegant as the trabectome. So this was introduced first, uh, but now with the commercial success of the Kahook dual blade, um, this device has been brought to market. It's a little different. We'll talk about this. The main differences are that this has uh, an irrigation aspiration uh, port while the uh, Kahook dual blade does not. And there are differences with regards to the amount of outflow segments tapped into. Uh, with a single bore device like the iStand first or second generation, you can get around 60 degrees of uh, outflow. That's so because there are these septations that I mentioned before. Um, well, the hydrus will probably push through some of them, so it will give you more flow potentially. Where this translates to better IOP control remains to be seen. This is an um, endoscopic device that um, ablates the trabecular meshwork and creates, I think, 300 micron holes, mainly used in Switzerland. This is the trabectome. With that, you can ablate over 90 degrees to each side. And then in addition to the 180 degrees, you would get around 30 degrees uh, flow past the ablation ends. Um, and of course, the other ones that I had mentioned, the 360 degree procedures, you can see now that the 240 degrees that I've drawn in here are actually not that far away from 360 degrees. So the effort that goes into the 360 degree uh, surgeries um, might not be justified. Most of the flow occurs nasally. That's where the large collectors are, um, probably almost nothing temporarily. So opening that might not yield so much. Complications compared. There are very few complications with appenternal trabeculectomy using the trabectum as an example. Uh, two of 1,127 patients had a cyclodialysis, malignant glaucoma in four, supercoroidal hemorrhage in one, enophthalmitis in one. Almost everybody has hyphema, blood in the anterior chamber to one extent or the other, but um, that is more of an indicator of a successful connection to the episcleral venous system and is the result of a, um, a low pressure immediately post-operatively, which causes this. This will go away within days to one or two weeks. Different with the trabeculectomies and tube shunts. Uh, this is from the original TVT study. 74% of traps required for the procedures, 27% of tubes. And then here, complications, uh, far fewer complications, uh, early complications in the tubes. When you look at where the flow occurs using fluorescein as a canalogram, uh, this is a pig eye looking into the camera, nasally ablated, same eye before and after. You see that the filling is much faster using the same timeline and also um, that it is 360 degrees. Uh, interesting because the pig does not have a single lumen Schlems canal. There are little segments um, of something that can look like Schlems canals. Um, and, and they are loosely connected. This is somewhat different with the eye stand. Um, again, single bore device, you get flow only in one area. Um, and here the trabectum just in comparison. What's interesting is that after the eye stand, um, during the during the combined procedure, I stand with FACO, you, you do get somewhat of a trabecular plasty-like effect on the remaining trabecular meshwork, which adds to the pressure reduction. Not that the pressure reduction is more compared to the trabectome, but this doing a FACO does help in this combined surgery simply because you're only opening a little and then the rest is probably getting hammered by the ultrasound. Um, FACO trabectome 
uh, does not differ from trabectum alone because there's not enough trabecular meshwork left to actually have any impact. Uh, almost all fluid enters here and then flows circumferentially. Technology and techniques. On the left, you see the trabectome, irrigation, aspiration, and two electrodes that create a, a pico lightning, and with that, you create plasma that then molecularizes the trabecular meshwork. It's not cautery, often misrepresented. It's more like yak, laser, where the tissue is disrupted. Uh, here is the generator um, that you have to half, uh, so there are overhead costs. Not so with the Trebex, you can plug this into a FACO machine or any other aspiration device, including this one, the tractor works too. Nice is that you have an active irrigation aspiration. And here you see um, a larger sketch of the trabectome, very little heat transfer to the outer wall, so that's protected. Um, and here the dual blade that happened to be serrated um, in the case of the Trebex to initiate a cut more reliably. Um, I've used the coke blade in, in many, many patients. Um, and um, th they have a smooth, uh, smooth ramps. Um, so with that, you sort of displace the meshwork, which also works. But um, here you can aspirate a, a truly cut strip. So this has perhaps certain advantages. Um, but the biggest um, difference here is the, the irrigation aspiration, which affords great view. Trabectome surgery on the left, insertion through a temporal clear corneal incision. Then the trabecular meshwork is engaged at a more acute angle towards the left, tip pointing up slightly to poke into the Schlem's canal. This, goes, this is easier to learn with pigmented meshworks here in a pigmentary glaucoma patient. In non-pigmented meshworks, this is harder to see. Um, uh, a common beginner mistake is to confuse this with the ciliary body band, which is painful, bleeds, and then there's no flow. Uh, so these users will quickly stop doing that. And so it's important that beginners uh, are mentored through the um, initial learning curve. Then you go one at uh, 90 degrees to the left, 90 degrees to the right, um, and be done with it. The Trabax surgery is very similar. Here you see the device going to the left. This is creating a strip that can be truncated. Um, I like to do this by turning it around. You can aspirate the strip, turn around, cut it, and then go to the other side and do the same. This is the eye stand, courtesy of Ike Ahmed. Thank you for the uh, very nice movies. Here the eye stand is placed through viscoelastic. Um, excellent insertion, makes it look easy. You will tap it to the left after the insertion to confirm that it's um, placed in the right spot and doesn't fall out. And here you see this going to the right. The eye stand in uh, the eye stand first generation came. Uh, as a two-in-one package in Canada, but not in other parts of the world. So uh, these patients <laughs> probably got a better pressure control because it gives you more access uh, to more drainage segments. Here, a very fascinating a little um, demonstration of how the flow works. This is Tripan Blue going in. Uh, there's an irrigation aspiration tip which creates pressure and you see this now flush through here um, confirming and you see also how this is blanched so the blood is displaced here that's great um, you think wow this is a really efficient surgery look how this is rushing away from the eye but um, this is also very high pressure uh, 110 water column uh, equals about 92 millimeter mercury in the eye so a um, little uh, cheating for the purpose of visualization. Um, actually, in this patient, they were three stents. So what you see here um, are three $1,000 implants doing this nice flow. Might not be economical for other parts of the world, but certainly it works, especially at a pressure of 92. Here you see the eye stent inject, smaller device, not necessarily easier. It's just a forward movement. You have to place it right, going in there. 
and boom and in the same injector there is a second one that's then placed to the right and then you confirm that it's placed right you might see a little uh, blood reflux results comparison there is uh, no difference between phaco trabectome in a single session compared to trabectome we used course and exact matching to create almost identical patient pairs and um, the pressure result and the medication reduction is equal. That's quite different from what happens when you combine FACO with the eye stent. There, FACO does add to the pressure reduction. Five-year data, um, this is uh, as main surgeon uh, Dr. Joel Schumann. Uh, when I got to UPMC, um, he had already started using the trabectome, also Dr. Ian Connor who I think was his fellow at the time. And so they did around 93 patients who we then followed for five years. This is also combined phaco and trabectome, so they don't have a very high pressure to start with. There's a mixed indication. Some have actually quite acceptable pressures, but want to have cataract surgery. So they're more interested in a medication reduction. And as a result, you have these somewhat not so impressive high preoperative pressures, but a pretty good drop and very sustained pressure reduction. Um, interestingly, you get a bigger pressure drop with higher IOP and uh, worse glaucoma. We created an index to sort of capture, uh, try to capture the clinical, clinical severity uh, and resistance to treatment for a clinician. So high pressure, bad visual field, many preoperative medications is in the group four. And here is something that's more akin to ocular hypertension. So bigger pressure drop in the worse glaucomas. Here is an electron microscopy view um, after of the outer wall of Schlem's canal after trabectome, courtesy of the late Doc Johnson. Um, I worked at the Mayo Clinic and did my uh, PhD there back in the days. Uh, what's fascinating with this picture is that you almost don't see the collector channel openings. They're sort of hidden. Some are very anterior, others are very posterior. And this might be the explanation why goniotomy and trabeculotomy, the disruption of the meshwork, doesn't work so well in adults. It works well in children because the scleral spur drops posterior. It's more elastic after a simple goniotomy. So same procedure, very different results in adults and children. This I here had a full width ablation with the trabectome, so there are no lips that can reproximate or roll over against these collector channel openings. And here you have um, trabectome results by degree of angle. Some have a very narrow angle, smaller than uh, two. There are also some, and unfortunately I didn't list them, with um, Sheffer grade two. Uh, they were 17 here and um, I think 15 in the phacotrabectome group. What's interesting to see is that the pressure reduction is the same in both groups. The open circles have the open angles, so there is no pressure difference and no medication difference. Same with the phacotrabectome. So you would think of removing a cataract has to help, but it doesn't. Um, that's strange. Trabectome here was done in phacic patients in these, uh, in this group here, not in pseudophagic patients. I have to emphasize. And when you compare the left to the right chart, the pressure is, again, not really different. You can also do trabectum after a failed trabeculectomy, uh, which was curious. You would think that these, uh, the old school thinking was that the collector channels, the whole outflow system somehow atrophies. You can actually show that the Stemps canal is a little smaller after trabeculectomy. So something happens when fluid bypasses the system, but you can resuscitate it with a, um, with a significant pressure drop. This is um, also somewhat similar to Ahmed implants. Again, a matching strategy where we created uh, nearly identical patient pairs. This surprised me. I was convinced the Ahmed would cause a bigger pressure drop. Not so. And the medications are even lower in the group with up internal trabeculectomy compared to tube shunts probably because there's a capsule forming around here since this is a foreign body, um, the Ahmed implant. Trabex versus trabectome. This is now dual blade excision versus ablation. Quite similar, uh, a little lower, oddly. Um, the question is, what does this mean? We'll see. Um, this is only day 30 so far. 
Um, these are 79 patients. Uh, we don't know yet how this will continue. Trivectum versus eye stent, however, is quite different at around in our hands. Uh, these are our patients. They were exact match, so they're literally identical in pressure and um, um, medications. You see a divergence where the um, black line, the eye stents go up, so pressure is in average higher than before the surgery, and the medications are also more than before the surgery. That does not happen with a trabectome, uh, that stays uh, more or less the same. Trabectome versus trabeculectomy, that's the big one, not published yet, but um, submitted. You can see here that the red line, the trabectome, is higher as expected, around 15. Uh, the trabeculectomy uh, from um, our hospital in Würzburg, they are uh, lower. And, but if you look at the surgical success and if you count any other intervention that's surgical as a failure, there goes your curve. Uh, that's basically capturing the uh, many procedures that are necessary after trabeculectomy. Uh, why is the trabectum so high? Does this mean that this is a pressure that's a success? No, this is the TVT criteria applied here. Um, and um, you could argue that many patients need a pressure that's lower than 15. So surely if you set the cutoff not to the TVT cutoff, 20% reduction, 21 millimeter mercury, but rather let's say 12, you would have many trabectums fail. No doubt about that. Okay, challenges. Well, there are your challenges with micro stents. Fibrosis um, and uh, foreign body reactions. Here is a scaffold. Um, in theory, you can compress and block other openings. And a biofilm. Um, it's a foreign body. There will be a biofilm. The lumen gets smaller. And the onset of this, um, when the explants were obtained, sort of fits the timeline that I'd shown you. At around six months, these things happen. Um, and it's not easy to place them. They're small, they don't do much harm, but um, getting them uh, to look as nice as you could see in Ike Ahmed's video is not trivial. Here's one in the cornea. We were asked, um, you know, strange, why is there no pressure reduction? Well, there won't be any unless this is a transcorneal um, implant, <laughs> which is not meant to be. In this case, it's just stuck in the endothelium. Um, and it's not so easy to learn. Here are some first cases by some of my fellows. You can see the tremor, the difficulty to control this. Um, maybe it's my influence and the anxiety I create in people that um, they're a little jittery. I hope not. Um, but kidding aside, uh, there is a learning curve that's rather steep. You see the learning curve here. From the first cases to the late cases, our surgeons had a short ablation, then a short nasal ablation that increased in size in these um, pig eyes here that we imaged with canalograms. Um, it turns out you get faster quickly. Uh, you reach an ablation length maximum at around 10.6 eyes, but you're already a pretty good um, secure surgeon at around five eyes. So. At least five eyes are necessary before one gets a steady hand, a little more to get a good ablation. Um, to get a consistent high yield in outflow, one would need around 26 eyes, so clearly more. Um, differences in and challenges with the angle view. Here is the uh, Trebex with the active irrigation aspiration, well-maintained chamber. In anterior segment OCT, you see a very deep um, chamber uh, with the KDB that you use through viscoelastic, bubbles, uh, no blood reflux because this is a model here, but certainly the challenges that we know. Going to the right, viscoelastic escapes, and the anterior chamber depth uh, disappears. The microscope is very important, obviously. Here's a very good microscope. You can see a pristine view with a nice xenon light, high color rendering index. You can tilt it well. This is embarrassingly me operating in a horrible microscope that you could almost not tilt. I don't know how on earth I was asked as a second surgeon to do the glaucoma part. And uh, lo and behold, this patient is, has to lie on his shoulder. He has 
uh, horrible shoulder pain this is a moving target and something is bleeding here which it shouldn't because the chamber is pressurized so terrible get yourself a good microscope and do these cases there um, what not to do in canal based surgery this is a courtesy of a very experienced anterior segment surgeon and a very good cataract surgeon with at least 20,000 cases under his belt he sent me this video asking why am I not getting uh, proper outflow uh, I do see reflux well I told them look there is the eye stent that didn't work you're now going into the supercortical space in this video sticking the rectum <laughs> repeatedly uh, patient wasn't too comfortable um, obviously and there was no outflow improvement because the psychodialysis wasn't deep enough he then went to the right in the same space and of course this didn't have a happy end the patient needed another surgery outlook where is the remaining distance we would expect the pressure to be eight after connecting the anterior chamber with the episcolar veins we remove the meshwork which we thought was the primary resistance in glaucoma but apparently that's not so it never drops to eight never is uh, not true uh, you actually do see this in a handful of patients um, but the higher the preoperative pressure the higher the postoperative pressure prior to starting medications there is a correlation and you can lower your pressure by adding nitric oxide in a pig model uh, we've shown that other groups have observed this too. Stamer lab, most notab notice, uh, notably, um, also in human eyes. So um, that actually is a reactive system, and it's somewhere here. We don't know what it is exactly, but we know that we can dilate it not just with NO, like I've shown you, also with Natarsidil, um, a rho kinase inhibitor, continuous dilation for a surprisingly long time, and an increased. Um, and outflow and pressure drop in summary epibarber versus based uh, canal based surgeries we said the canal based surgeries are safer the uh, technology and techniques i showed you some examples of stents and ablation results in comparison the iop after up internal trabeculectomy is not affected by cataract surgery it is similar to tube shunt surprisingly better than stents but worse than trabeculectomies as far as pressure is concerned. Outlook, um, there is a distal outflow resistance, but we don't know where it is. I need to thank my lab members and of course our collaborators as well as the funding bodies. Thank you for your attention.